Hello, boys and girls. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom, part of the Pearl of Wisdom show and the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. And today, I'm going to be looking at it, the tennis game mark, where every team looks like they're heading, where they're at, where I projected them to be, and where they may want to fill in roster spots, or are they going to be uh, trading some players away? Otherwise, I haven't did a video for a while because I mostly do trade videos. It's my favorite thing in the land to do that. But the first 10 games of the season, it's kind of hard to get a read. But here we're going to be leaning into it a little bit. We're going to be looking at, uh, based on the first 10 games, and I know any things can change. We all know that. But we can get a pretty good read after the first 10 games where a team might be heading. And uh, if they keep on going that right way, where they may be going as far as filling roster spots, where their weaknesses are, and uh, you know who may who they may be looking to push out somewhere to get assets back and all of those sort of things like that. So we're going to be looking at that from Anaheim to Nashville in this episode, part one of where are they? I get, I don't know if that's what it's called. I just where are they now? All right. Yeah. First 10 games. What's my uh, view so far? What's your view for so far? Comment in the comment section what you think of your team. Uh, if you hear anything that you disagree with or you completely agree with, subscribe to my channel. Let me know in the comment section. Also, if you subscribe to my channel, I do live uh, analysts. Live analyst play by play with uh, Peyton on the radio and Off the Wall John. You can be part of that too. Oh, it's fun. There will be frolic. That I know for sure. All right. Let's take a look at the beginning here with the Anaheim Ducks and where they are, where they're going to be, and what may happen in Anaheim land. All right. Anaheim's had a rough start to the season, but you got to look at things from perspective. Now, I did have them out of the playoffs by quite a bit. However, and the main reason why I had them out of the playoffs by quite a bit was the beginning of their schedule was brutal. Six games on the road, three at home. For a young team, they needed to hit their stride hard here. Young teams... It takes a while for players for P, for players to be able to play a full 82 game schedule. It's a grind. It's there's a lot that goes with it. There are a lot of ways that you try to prepare yourself all through the year. This is a reason why we bring they bring veterans in. Or teams bring veterans in to help these kids along to be able to make it through an 82 game schedule. There, uh, how you designate your time, how you how your mind process all the way through. Do you get too down? Do you get too up? All of those sort of things like that. And I personally did not find that Anaheim really brought in guys after Getzloff left that had a full concept of that really as well. Ryan Strom, he's 29 years old. He's been in the league for a while. He's never been known as what you would call a leader in the room. And it sounds like that's kind of what his role is here, which makes it pretty difficult, especially when you're filling the shoes of somebody like Getzlaff. And I was just really suspect of whether he was going to be able to do that. And we'll still see. We'll still see if he, if he is. I mean, I'm not in the room all the time. I don't see all of these players on an individual basis. But it just didn't seem like the pick for me, sort of like Frank Vetrano as well. These are guys that have been, all their careers have been part of teams. They haven't been leaders of teams. Nobody's thought of them as leaders of teams. Ryan Strom's been on the Islanders, Edmonton, and the Rangers, and he was a part of the team. Same as Frank Fatrano. He's a guy that go is a is a guy that works into a line. He doesn't run the line. Neither does Ryan Strom, and they're trying to do that here now with a bunch of young players which is tough. I've, I'd be looking more for veterans that have already shown that they're capable of running lines, that 
have been leaders in the past, probably was difficult to find. So my thought process was here with Verbeek, and also, by the way, John Klingberg as well. Same thing. He's never been a leader on a team. He's been a guy that's worked in the mix of a team. And I think this team is really missing that without Getzloff being there. So I really thought that Verbeek here was adding a few players, seeing how it works out, helping Trevor Zegers as much as they can do with what the knowledge that they have. And he's been playing very well, by the way. Um, but in the end, by the time trade line comes around, look for guys like Ryan Strom, Vetrano, and John Klingberg, who's only on a one-year deal, to be used to get more picks, bring in more depth to this lineup. Because honestly, the depth in Nashville, it's getting, or sorry, in Nashville, and Anaheim is getting better. They got a lot of, you know, they have some young pieces here that could, are going to be able to come up and take over, such as, uh, hopefully, anyways, um, such as, uh, you know, Austin Strand. He may have a chance. Lucas Dosko and goal. Jacob Perot, Braden Tracy. These guys have been working their way in to, into shape to becoming pieces to be worked in later for a bit now. But nothing that really blows your mind, to tell you the honest truth. Sam, Ca Sam Colangelo, he'll be in there eventually. You know, but nothing that really blows your mind. Their depth, as far as a team that's rebuilding, is really not that strong. And I think he did this. He did what he did, that being Verbeek, the general manager of Anaheim Ducks, with the thought process of at the deadline using these players for assets. So he gave them, what's that, Vitrano got uh, 3.6 till 2025, and Strom till 2027, a four-year deal. I don't think there was too many teams out there that were pining to give those guys super long deals. So he could say, look, come here, I'll give you the, come into Anaheim, we'll see how you do. We'll give you a four-year deal. And if it doesn't work out, I'll probably move you at the deadline, but they get the security for their family with only one move, if they have to move, for a long term where they probably wouldn't have got that on another team. They might have been able to stay there that year, but they wouldn't have had the financial security. So I'd like to move that way, but I, you know, as far as what the team is, you know, I don't think I didn't think this was even close to a playoff team yet. I like what they're going to be in the future. I like what Verbeek is doing, but I didn't think they were close to a playoff team yet. And, you know, you have John Gibson who swears up and down he wants to be part of the process here. But man, he is getting lit up. 424 and a 0. Uh, 0.889. And honestly, he he looks great sometimes and then he doesn't others. I think he's just taken a lot of rubber. I, I really think it, it would be best for him to move on. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, I don't know. If he sticks around, maybe by the time he's 32, this team is killer, especially if they got a, get a great draft pick this year. So now they're heading, they're, they, they had a terrible schedule to begin with. They're going to be going on the road again. Here, this is October 31st, Halloween. Again, after already having six games on the road already, and they're playing San Jose, Vancouver, San Jose. Those are some winnable games. But being on the road that much that long is tough against no matter who you're playing with. And I think Verbeek looked at the schedule and said, you know what, I don't think this is the year. We'll see if I'm right. Tell me what you think, Anaheim Ducks fans, about that. And if they would move on from these players, if you saw that coming or if you think like that, um, subscribe to my channel and let me know. Next, the Arizona Coyote. Okay, uh, what I've seen so far with the Arizona Coyote. Now, their record, which is not really something you need to look at too much here with Arizona. There's not much on this team that screams, you know, playoff. They're 2 5 and 1. Um, just had a game against the Rangers. But the thing is, is they've actually looked really good. I, I Like for what they have in their lineup, Arizona has looked actually really good. 
Um, they're competing. They're working hard. I think Turney's a fantastic coach. So what goes forward for the future for Arizona? Well, Dylan Gunther possibly getting a Rookie of the Year award. He has been absolutely fantastic. He's from where I'm from in the Edmonton area. And, uh, you know, uh, he, it's been talked about a lot that he was going to play young, early and often and play well. Most people that I knew here that knew Dylan Gunther, one person I know who played with him, said he will likely make the roster really quick, and he certainly has. And that's awesome to look forward to. Um, so the future... I think most. I don't think you're going to see a lot of players being traded away here. Although probably Shane Gosh Despair will be used with his point production for some picks, especially if they can get a first in 2023. 2023 is a tough year to get picks for. There, it's a deep draft. It's got superstars in it. Top three: Fantilli. Uh, I can't believe I just forgot their names. Bedard, can't believe I just forgot, and Michkov. So there's not going to be too many teams wanting to give up firsts here. But I like what they've been doing, grabbing 2024 firsts, uh, that being Armstrong. And I like what he's been doing with all the picks that he has and the way he's picked up picks. Now, I want to get into a little bit with, uh, with uh, Arizona. Because it's pretty much the same thing here. Maybe Cassie and maybe you get a couple guys like uh, Bukestad. They're giving a lot of ice time right now to try to increase his value. Maybe they get some picks from him. But I want to talk about the arena situation in Arizona more than anything here. Because that's really the biggest topic when it comes to Arizona. Personally, Arizona fans, I think people there's there, there are people out there that are just snobs. And I think it's been over-talked about, about the fact that they're, I mean, overlooked down upon. Let's put it that way. They have an owner who has is forking over money. Maybe the league is helping out or whatever the case may be. The arena is going to take a while. Arena deals take a while. The Calgary Flames, for instance, had a tough time with their arena deal. I'm here in Edmonton. It was a little easier, but... Arena deals take a while, no matter what, you, what you're doing. And we need this team in Arizona. I think the fan base is going to get stronger, just like it did in LA, just like it did in San Jose. Untraditional markets that did well. And I think that it's overdone that they have to play in a 5,000-seat arena. I would rather see a 5,000-seat arena full of fans creating excitement, um, you know, I know the ticket prices are high, and I understand like they have to make money, and it's unfortunate a lot of people can't afford to see the games. But for those that can, you're building a fan base. You're building a fan base that's exciting, it's fun, it's electric that I've seen so far. The Rangers played there last night, and um, it's a story that's going to be for Arizona for a long time. As far as it looking bad on the league, depends on how you look at it. I don't look like at that at all. I see a league that is wanting Arizona to be successful, and they should be wanting it to be successful, and they're doing what they can to have it be successful. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's silly the way people try to make it out like it's some black mark on the league or something like that. But people just like to make stuff up and poo-poo everything. So. That's my take on it, Arizona fans. Tell me what you think in the comment section. And I'll get back to you. Subscribe to my channel and let me know. Boston Bruins. Okay, this team has surprised me. No doubt about that. And it shouldn't surprise me. And that's what really I get. How? Why would I think that Boston is going to not do well? I mean, you deserve all you Boston fans out there. Comment in the comment section and tell me I told you so. This team has a culture that just wins. It, it doesn't seem to matter within reason, of course, who's in the lineup. Um, Marshawn comes back early, which is cray-cray. 
a month early, gets three points in his first game back. But all the way along here, uh, Boston has just found ways to win. Now, I do believe that they did a lot of that winning at home, that their strength of schedule was, you know, it was pretty good. For, it was a pretty good schedule for them. But it doesn't matter. You lose Marshawn. You lose McAvoy. Um, they struggled on defense last year. And, yes, they are 6-0-0 at home and 2-1 and away. We'll see what that happens when they go on the road. But they had some big wins in those spots. And they didn't back down. And they didn't stop looking like Boston. You know, they, they still look like Boston all the way. That what I mean by Boston is, like, the effort was always there. They do what they have to win. You got guys like Hampus Lindholm that are is playing absolutely fantastic and kind of shows you something that I didn't talk about with Anaheim is that I'm a little concerned with their defense development there. They've had a lot of players that haven't really hit their stride. Boston probably recognized that. Paid a crap load for Hampus Lindholm, and he's earning every penny. Derek Forbert's having a great season this year. After I talked to a lot of Boston fans, and they were basically wanting to ship him out, and I didn't blame him. He wasn't all that great, but he's having a great season this year. Um, Connor Clifton is stepping up. Just the step-up mentality and the culture here. And Linus Allmark, who I, when they made this deal, I actually loved it. And then last year, I was like, hmm. You know, but it appears that it has taken just, that took a year for Linus Olmark to find his comfort spot and now is playing out of his head. Amazing. Um, David Krejci has been out a little bit, hasn't stopped him. Nothing stops this team in Boston. And uh, for their future, what do I think for their future? I think they're going to try to get, you know, as they get, accumulate cap room, sending guys down, injuries, all of those sort of things like that, they're going to add and go for it. What else are you going to do here? You got older guys on your team. Uh, you're, there's no reason to look back. So I think they're going to add probably to their defense if they can add some depth to their offense. But even that has been not too bad. Charlie Coyle with five points. Craig Smith, uh, Nick Felino had four points in nine games. And, and look at A.J. Greer, who they found out of the barrel. Um, amazing. It's, it's, it really is amazing. You lose Marshawn for as long as you did. No McAvoy. Last year without McAvoy, they had a very difficult time. All of a sudden, boom. By the way, didn't mention Montgomery. That was the one thing I said when I said I thought Boston would struggle this year. Watch out for Montgomery, though. He is a great coach, and we're seeing it here. No, Cassidy got a little stale. They brought in a fantastic coach in uh, Montgomery, and they keep moving on. Subscribe to my channel, Boston fans. Give me, give me crap for selling them short. I don't know why I did. I never will again. I promise you that. All right, next, Buffalo Sabres. And this was a team that I had in a playoff spot this year. And uh, I was iffy about it, I have to say. But I just love, love, love Granado as a coach. And uh, when you have guys like that, and why didn't I think this way about Boston, by the way? I love, love, love Montgomery as a coach. But for some reason, I didn't apply that to Boston. But I do apply it to Buffalo. Um, I love him as a coach. I think this team is gelling really well. They have a lot of players that are hitting their stride. I love Alex Tuck. I love Dylan Cousins, and they're, they're playing well. I thought Casey Middlestat was going to have a breakout year. So far, it looks like he probably will. Um, the thing that has me a little concerned, though, because the reason why I liked Buffalo so much was the strength of their underrated defense. And I love teams with underrated defenses this is the reason why I picked LA last year to make the playoffs when nobody else was was also because they had an underrated defense and underrated team overall same as Buffalo those kind of teams can go into cities and they don't get the credit they deserve so teams 
play their backups against them and all those sort of things like that. And before you know it, they're winning. However, we had some injuries, didn't we? Matias Samuelson being injured week to week is tough. Um, I love the contract he got, by the way, $4.5 million a year. He looked last year like a very, very mature 21-year-old, and he looked like a guy that was going to be a top-two defenseman. I think that contract is going to be gravy in the future, but unfortunately he's injured now. Uh, and Enrique, uh, Henri Yokiharyu, who's more of an offensive guy, I think he's more replaceable than Samuelson. So now you're going to have Jacob Bryson play up. And I like Jacob Bryson, don't get me wrong. I imagine he will do not bad in that spot. Um, also, another reason was I said to my – I also am a professional handicapper. I give bets to people and they pay me for it. And uh, I had – I gave my clients Rasmus Dahlin as a future to win the Norris this year at like plus – 10,000 or something, like way up there. I said, throw 10 bucks on it because I love this kid. And look at him, 10 points in eight games, five goals. He could do it. He could do it. And Owen Power, I, I know he's only 19 years old, but when I saw last year, I was like, this guy is like way above his years. The future of Buffalo's defense is insane. It's going to be one of the best defense, if not the best defenses in the league. The other, everybody's issue was in goal, and mine too. I just like Derek Comrie, but we'll see. We'll see. His numbers aren't spectacular right now. Craig Anderson's 41 years old. But I also thought that they could get another goaltender somewhere along the line, especially if they're really knocking it out of the park. Oh, yeah, right. We lost Lyabushkin Laya too. Only day to day. When he comes back, the defense should be okay. It should still be good. Um, so what do I think for the future for Buffalo? It's kind of a wait and see mode. I don't see them being sellers all that much this year. Um, they're, they don't really have much to sell besides maybe Victor Olofsson. If they're right out of it during play, uh, come playoff or come uh, trade deadline time, Maybe Victor Olofsson or something like that. But I think this team just keeps on building with the youth that they already have, keeps on growing as a team. I don't think you'll see too many changes. If they're right in the playoffs, they could be buyers, especially if the goaltending is kind of iffy right now. You could see some go after a goaltender. Um, that would be my main thing. I could see them going after a goaltender somewhere along the line. All right. Tell me what you think about that, Buffalo Sabres fans. On to Subscribe to my channel and let me know. On to the next team, the Calgary Flames. And before the season started, my lean was that Calgary would struggle a bit offensively. So far, it hasn't really. They haven't really. They're both middle of the league. And they're sort of middle of the league defensively. And people thought, oh, you're crazy. They got Huberto. They got Caudry. Uh, how could they struggle defensively? And as you can as you can see here, Sutter has now, as of today, the 31st, looks like he's moved Elias Lindholm down in the lineup with Toffoli. He's shaking it up. He's got Dubé with Bachman and Coleman trying to get, see, that trying to get the right combination because the combination didn't seem to be working all that great. I, I think Huberto Caudry is a better spot for Huberto. But the reason why I thought that Huberto might struggle a bit this year is Calgary plays a man on man defense and Florida played a zone. And Ho Huberto didn't play the zone. He he basically flew the zone all the time. He he played very cherry pick type hockey. Um his offense was fantastic. He's not he's an unbelievable passer, but his Defense was not great. Let's put it that way. And I, I thought he was going to struggle. So a lot of people people will say, all even coaches will say, defense produces offense. It's true. It produces team offense. It, however, does not usually produce individual offense. So I thought Huberto would slide a little bit. 
uh, I thought he might have a little bit of a difficult time adjusting, and it appears that he has. Kadri, on the other hand, I didn't think he'd have a time, uh, as much time adjusting. I also didn't think he'd be a 100-point player again. Um, but with Sutter, I thought Kadri was going to benefit the most. Seems like he is right now. Overall, the offense just hasn't looked great to me yet, and that could change over time here, but I still think it's going to struggle over the season. Defense, on the other hand, as far as actual manpower getting Uyghur, I thought was going to be absolutely spectacular, and it has been. It has been very, very good. Um, the problem I had was when you lose Goudreau and you lose Kachuk, Goudreau, Kachuk especially, your two, the two-way play from the forwards was going to take a hit, especially when you're talking about bringing in Huberto. And that seems to be an issue here. Sutter seems to be saying as much. It's going to take some time to adapt. I did think Calgary was going to slip a little bit. Their record right now is 6-2, and two, I believe. So, I mean, they're not slipping all that bad. But I do believe they have had a strength of schedule, have they not? Yeah. Mostly at home. So we'll see how they are on the road. They're going to have to see how they're on the road. I thought this. I thought Calgary wasn't going to be as good as people thought. I'll see if that turns out to be the, same, the case. I also thought before the season started that one of these defensemen will be used to bring in a forward. And I still think that now. Tell me what you think, Calgary Flames fans. Do you, uh, do you see that uh, using their strength in defense? Who? I'm not sure. Um, I don't like moving ten of, you know, I'm not sure about, I, I love Zadaroff, maybe he, but I don't know how much offense he brings back. But a package of players, maybe another forward, a defenseman, and a first, and you get a top-notch forward to uh, play. Because Lucic, Lindholm, and Toffoli, what, what's their injury situation like? Like, there's not many injuries going on here. Uh, so this lineup down the, down the lineup is lacking offense and they could use some offensive depth. Tell me what you think about that Calgary Flames fan. Subscribe to my channel and let me know in the comment section. Carolina Hurricanes and what I've seen so far with Carolina. I, I see a team that's playing really well, but not the best I've seen them play. You know, um, they... It's I I just it just doesn't feel like it's all there. Uh, against the Islanders, for instance, they had a second period where they just fell apart. Now their schedule has been tough, and that could be part of it as well. Um, I believe they have yeah, look four or well, two games at home and five games on the road in a Western road trip. That pretty much explains it. I I don't see. Carolina, I mean, they still have a winning record, and they had a brutal schedule. So what does that tell you? They're going to keep on flying. I had them possibly as a president's trophy, um, but I don't know if that will actually pan out or not. They may start to uh, kind of take it easy as the season goes on and pace themselves and stuff like that. Maybe they won't. The, 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 I don't think Carolina has ever had a president's trophy, and quite often, like Florida last year, that's a motivation to at least capture that. But we know how they call it the President's Trophy curse. I don't think it's a curse as so much as the teams that win the President's Trophy, quite often, um, they don't pace themselves throughout the year. And by the time the playoffs come, they're spent. It's something if you watch Tampa Bay, they've learned well. Uh, St. Louis when they won that year, they sort of, Colorado, you're going to see it. It really is something you have to do. And you end, and, te and great teams end up losing to a lot in a lot of spots where you're like, how the heck did they lose that game? But you got to pace yourself throughout the year. So, And I think Brindamore knows that, so I think you'll see that down the road. As far as what they may be looking for to add to the lineup down the road if they wish to do so, it all depends on what Kasperi Kokaniemi does. So far, I haven't really noticed him all that much, and I thought he was going to have a breakout year. 
if he continues to struggle down there, I, I there I think they could look like look for a semi rental center to play with Nietzsche and uh, Svechnikov there in the middle. But Nietzsche has been fantastic. Seth Jarvis has been a little. He's looked good. He's had his chances. I think he'll be fine. Tara Vinen really hasn't lit it up. Like these are guys that are usually going so. They got a winning record, a very good winning record, and some of their guys are not hitting their stride yet. I think they're going to be fine. I think they're going to be fantastic. Tell me what you think about that, Carolina fans. Let me know in the comment section, and uh, I'll chat with you, don't you know. Subscribe to my channel and let me know. All right, Chicago Blackhawks. Wow, is this a surprise. Now, before the season started, I said, yeah, I think Chicago is going to finish last. But it depends on what this coach Richardson is like. Max Domi came out publicly and said the reason why he wanted to go to Chicago was because of Richardson. I heard nothing but great things about Richardson. But the fact is he was a rookie coach. So I'm like, a rookie coach after losing to Brinkat and all these guys, you know, like everybody else, I think I figured they would be in last place. They've come out strong. They've done very well. They're playing harder than they were last year. So uh, Richardson, a lot harder. That's an understatement, actually. 4-3-2 and two to start the year. Kind of half and half games on the, uh, at home and on the road. Um, but a solid start. Now, do I think that's going to keep on going? I think probably not. I mean, this team is very young. You got, uh, you know, Taylor Radish is 24, Philip Kurashev, who's having a fantastic year to start the year, um, is 23, you know, Reese Johnson. These are like Kachuk, and these are not that young players, but they're players that came mostly from other teams or, or and are really just learning what it be, is to be in the NHL right now. And it takes some time. And usually young players like that, they wear out as the season goes on. We'll see if that actually happens. I think it's more than likely. I mean, is Alex Stalock is a wonderful story. He, uh, he didn't play at all last year. He's had, uh, I think, hip issues or something like that. Comes back from surgery and he's putting up fantastic numbers for a team that isn't strong defensively. You got guys like, you know, Jared Tenorti didn't make it in several teams so far this year or so far in his career. Caleb Jones, uh, you know, is kind of like a, a, an outskirts player. And Jones has been hurt now as well. Jack Johnson playing. Jack Johnson's playing like 22 minutes a night. And this is a guy that could barely make Colorado's lineup. So I think over time they'll probably start slipping. Um, but it's fun to watch now. I'm really excited for Chicago fans that they're seeing a team that tries as hard as this team does. And I'm really happy for Luke Richardson to get a shot here and make the most of it to be able to be what everybody else said he was going to be. It's fun. But I think some. I think down the road they'll start to slip. And then the Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taze rumors will start coming out. From what I understand, Patrick Kane is pretty sold on sticking around after me doing trade video and trade video. But maybe Jonathan Taves has publicly said that he wouldn't want to do something like that. However, he's playing really well. Five goals and two assists. Looks great, which is fantastic for if they decide to move him or if they decide to keep him. Tell me what you think about that, Chicago Blackhawks fans. Subscribe to my channel and let me know. All right, next. Uh, Colorado Avalanche and okay last year the Colorado Avalanche started two and six that's right two and six so are we worried about the fact that they're kind of about that right now I think they're somewhere around two and six not even four four and one and they most most of their games have been on the road so far and They have been uh, working in new players in the lineup. They lost Kadri, so 
They're, they're giving Alex Newhook a shot. His minutes have kind of died. I thought he was more ready than he was. But I was incorrect about that. I thought Newhook would be able to take that spot and do fairly well. But it looks like it's kind of not working out that way. JT Comper is not the guy. So I think for sure, for sure, they're going to be looking for a center down the road. Now you say, well, why didn't they sign Kadri? Well, Kadri was asking for quite a bit of money for quite a bit of term. Joe Sackick obviously doesn't like giving older players that much term. And he figures that somewhere down the road, if it doesn't work out, they can pick out a player at the deadline. They have, they have some assets um, to do it. Valerie Nichushkin has been every bit as good as I thought he was going to be. And when he you know, goes back into the roster, then, you know, that second line doesn't look that bad. But there is a pretty big hole in the middle, no doubt about it. And I imagine they'll try to find a way to fill it. Looking at the defense, it's fantastic. Spectacular defense this year. McCarr still hasn't had a goal this year, which is a little bit concerning, but I'm sure he'll pile them on after a while. It's just taking some time to work everybody in the lineup, get to know each other, get to know what they're going to do. Um, my biggest concern was Alexander Gorgiev, and honestly, he hasn't looked great to me. Again, um, I'm still concerned about it. He, I was concerned about Gorgiev, and the reason why I was concerned about Gorgiev is because I didn't like his attitude in New York. He seemed to be crushed by the fact that he was a backup to Shesterkin. It just seemed like a lot of immaturity to me. And when he went and played and won against the Rangers, he jumped up and down like he won the cup. Like, really, man? It means, can, can we just focus on becoming the best goaltender we can be without comparing yourself to people? And maybe they'll work that in him. You know, they'll help him along with that as it goes, if that is, in fact, a problem and everything else, and he'll become better as a goaltender. But I, out of all the things Joe Sackick has done, this is the one that had me going, mm, I don't know, buddy. I don't know. The good news is that they can probably fix that somewhere as the season goes on. So I think a, a number two center is going to be on the cards, I would say, unless one of these guys can turn it around and step up which right now I'm just not seeing. And, uh, you know, I hope maybe that's a probably a rental in the two, three-year mode or maybe even one year to give it a shot because I really do think Newhook is going to be a fantastic player and he's only 21 years old. So I don't think they're going to want to get anybody long-term. If they did, they probably would have kept Claudry, right? Um, and I think the team will be fine. They started off slow. Last year, they're starting off this year slow. A lot of their games have been on the road. So it's just taking some time for them to gel. And, uh, you know, they have assets to be able to, they have some decent assets if they have to, to move to get some players down the road to help them out. All right. Tell me what you think about that, Colorado fans. Let me know. What do you think your team is looking like in the future? How pissed off at you are they that they didn't sign Kadri and all that kind of stuff? Love to talk to you about it. Subscribe to my channel and let me know. Columbus Blue Jackets. And oh my, has this team looked bad. So bad. No heart in this lineup at all. And I had it. I, I didn't have them making the playoffs. But I kind of thought they would be better than they are right now. Of course, you get Johnny Goudreau. You think, oh, we got Johnny Goudreau now. But the thing is, what are the Columbus Blue Jackets? Um, even last year, they weren't all that difficult to play against last year. Um, their defense was never, wasn't really all that great last year. Uh, offensively, they were fine. They skated well. And I think that they took some teams by surprise because of their speed. They kind of took a step up in that department. And a lot of teams took them by surprise. They, they took a lot of teams by surprise last year. Not only that, there was really bad teams last year to feed off in the East. Detroit was not very good. Ottawa was not very good. Uh, you know, they uh, just... Uh, to, 
really bad teams in the East last year for them to feed off. They don't have that this year. And I don't know. They just look lost, man. They, they look like they have very little direction. They very little confidence. Um, goaltending has not been good. Look at these. 4.75, 3.57. Um, what are they going to I think they're going to have to, you know, and there's not much many players to sell off here. They've kind of sold off at the deadline previously. I mean, maybe Gustav Nyquist they might be able to get a pick from and all that, but good thing they're struggling like this now because this draft is absolutely fantastic. And they are likely going to get, I think they're going to get a very good draft pick here and get a very good player. Just keep on building. But honestly, I think they have to add a leader, a spiritual leader to this team. Goudreau is a solid player, but he's not a guy that's like rah-rah in the room. Lyonnais kind of got a head about him. He's just a goal scorer or likes to show up and score. For me, and you can tell me what you think about this, Lion A looks like he doesn't even care if he wins or not, honestly. He looks like all he cares about is how many goals he gets. If we win, whatever. I could be wrong. I, I was a little bit like this in Winnipeg. He was very mouthy to the, to the, when he left Winnipeg, and uh, I was concerned. Also, the big red flag for me was when they let Tortorella go, and he was saying things like, I'm just not that type of guy. That's not the way I play. I just need to be me. If you're not the type of guy for Tortorella, usually those guys don't end up being doing too well. You know, and you, you look down in the history of players that have not done well for Tortorella. Where are they now? Duclair? Uh, deep, uh, what's his name that went to Winnipeg? Four Lyonie? Dubois, Johansson in Nashville. They never became great. They did okay, but they never became great. So that was a red flag for me. And now he's kind of supposed to be their leader. You know, Boone Jenner is their leader. And I love Boone Jenner. But one guy, it's, just, it's not enough for just one guy. They need more accountability in the room here, I think, in Columbus. Let me know what you think about that, Columbus Blue Jackets fan. Subscribe to my channel and talk to me about it. All right, Dallas Stars. So all the DeBoer is a bad coach people out there. I know it's early, but nine games played, and they are flying on the road yet. They didn't even have a strength of schedule uh, really strong schedule. Like, yeah, they've been four games on the road, four games at home. Home last year they crushed, and they're still doing it. Uh, I have to admit, I had this team kind of on the bubble, but watching them now, nah. Um, the biggest problem, of course, is Audi. They don't know how long he's going to be out. they got to have Audi. Wedgwood just isn't going to do it. He's not bad. He's okay, but he's not enough. You, you really can't have Wedgwood as your goaltender for a long period of time and win, win on a regular basis. If you do, you're doing amazing. But I, I said before the season, I love the Mason Marchman pickup, and look, he's doing fantastic here. Taylor Sagan looks like he's a new guy. You know, Jamie Benn, beautifully, he's put on the third line now. That's what he is now. He's a very expensive third liner. You just got to live with it, right? And then this Wyatt Johnson kid, they drafted in 2021, had a spectacular year in junior last year, and has come in and looked absolutely fantastic. Um, it's been a huge boost to this team to have a young kid like that come up because depth, offensive depth was a an issue. Of course, we all know about Robertson. Guy is an absolute beast. Ropo hints. Joe Pavelski is going to play till he's 90 or whatever. I have no idea. Does this guy ever freaking stop? He's on a point-of-game pace now at 38 years old. You watch him on the ice and you're like, 
This guy's 38? Jeez, unbelievable. Tell me what this guy is taking in the morning. I want it. Um, love the guy. Love him, love him, love him. Uh, Miro Hiskanen, day-to-day, is going to be great. The whole defenses look spectacular. Niels Lundqvist, I, when they picked him up from the New York Rangers, and I'm telling you, we'll talk about this when we talk about the New York Rangers, I wasn't high on them to begin the year. I really thought they could be in tough. I think they're going to make the playoffs, but I don't think it's – and this is the reason why. Why Letting guys like Niels Lundqvist go – and giving Truba the captaincy to me was just I, I don't I don't get it. Nils Lundqvist was a very 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 good young player. Dallas, who has done an awesome job of identifying youth in their lineup, period. Probably the biggest strength to this organization is their draft and development and identifying young players. And he's just crushing. He's, he, they have him on the second pairing here, but he can play top pairing. This guy, is that's going to look like one of the greatest deals if New York Rangers whiffs on that first the, in Dallas's history. Seriously, I think of that high of him. So when Audi comes back, I think this lineup is just going to keep on flying. Even if he doesn't, they'll probably hold on enough to, until he's back. And what do I think they're going to do with their future? I think they're going to add any way they can. They're just going to try to build up cap space and uh, probably add to their offensive depth and keep it going, keep the ball rolling, my friends. Um, they got to go for it now. There's no reason not to. to how I, are they going to do in the playoffs? I don't know. What to, this is a team. This is a team that, that would be a really good um, pick right now for futures. I'm a professional handicapper, bpalpicks.com. Check it out if you want. Um, get yourself a free week there. And I think I'd be putting a sneaky pick in here for a future for Dallas. Tell me what you think, Dallas fans. Let me know in the comment section. And uh, subscribe to my channel. All right, next. The Detroit Red Wings. Hope I didn't miss anybody there. Uh, the Detroit Red Wings, I was on the fence about this team to start the year. They're looking really, they're looking good though. They, they've had some tough competition and they've had their bumps and bruises literally and figuratively. Tyler Bertuzzi is out for what, five weeks? Um, Fabri, is he ever going to come back? Four months, my gosh. I don't know what he's going to be uh, and, and these injuries have been difficult. And, of course, Jacob Barana having personal issues there. So for a lineup that really has had to have guys step up, I think they've done well. Um, so far, I think they're about, what, a 500 team? Detroit, 4-2-2. Two, and two. Eight games played, 4-2-2. Two, and two. A lot of them on, at home. We'll see what they are going to be as a road team. But they've held themselves in, and I had them as a bubble team before the season started. And the reason why is I, I really still was not sold on the defense. Um, I don't think Ben Chirot, like, for instance, people thought, okay, they're, they're bringing in Ben Chirot so Moritz Sider can have more freedom to for offense. But... As you can see, Maurice Sider's offense has not improved so far. And I actually said, I don't think that's going to happen because Ben Chirot is not a defensive defenseman, believe it or not. A lot of people think he is, but he's not. He flies his own a lot. He likes to skate the puck out of the zone. He's not actually very good defensively. So Maurice Sider is the one picking up the slack which he is, and doing spectacularly, but I just didn't get what Ben Sherratt pickup was about. I'd love to talk to Stevie. Why is he a genius? And I hate uh, questioning what a guy like genius like Stevie Y does, but I really, I really didn't understand the signing. I don't know, like, his, did he have an analytics team? If he had an analytics team, like, they'd be going, you know that he's not a very good... Now, if you're bringing Ben Sherrod in, 
So Moritz Sider can play more offense. Why? He's not great defensively. So somebody tell me in the comment section what I'm what I'm doing there. Uh, and like I said, if you you know, there's going to be people that disagree with me, but so far you have to admit, more Moritz Sider's offense has diminished since uh, Sherrod came in, not increased. Uh, Ole Ole Mata. Uh, also, he's okay. He, he's got more offense. I'm sure that's not going to stay that way. Uh, but Philip Peronic, uh, he, was, he was probably brought in so Philip Peronic can do the same, have more freedom to go offensively. He's not that great defensively. Neither is Robert Hag. Uh, he's, he's okay. He's not bad. He's, he's good in that spot. Um, I, w I was a little unsure about Ville Husso, but he's looked really good. I was sure that Nedeljkovic probably wouldn't be that great, and he's not. I didn't think he was that great to begin with. But overall, what do I think is going to be in the future? Well, I just think that they're going to need to get when they get Bertuzzi back. Uh, hope you know Jacob Jacob Barana probably has as much time as he needs to his for his issue there. Whenever he comes back, though, this team will probably do very well. I just had my reservations about how they would be defensively. Also, they're very young. And because some of these guys are out, um, guys like Mason Raymond, people are asking me, what's going on with Mason Raymond? Well, he'll probably pick it up, but no, everybody knows who Mason Raymond, Lucas Raymond. Everybody knows who Lucas Raymond is now. Last year, they didn't. Now, watch out for Lucas Raymond. So don't be surprised if his numbers are a little down from last year. You know, that's just the way, that's the way it usually goes. That's why they have the sophomore slump. They have to learn how to play now that everybody knows who you are. Uh, Philip Zadina, like Matt Luff, like right now until they come back, I think they're going to be about a 500 team. At the deadline, if everybody comes back and they're in a spot, maybe they're buyers. If they're not in a spot, I don't think they're sellers much either because there's not much to sell. I'll tell you one thing. It's fun to watch Elmer Soderblom and uh, uh, what's his name, Michael Rasmussen, who's who got suspended here, play at six six and six eight. I love that line. I love that line just because they're big and they're fun to watch. But I think they'll. Pro I I I had Buffalo making the playoffs and Detroit missing. I'm starting to. I'm really starting to think that maybe I might be off there. All right. Tell me what you think about that, Detroit fans. Subscribe to my channel and let me know. My internet's out for a little bit, so we're going to be going on to... Um, I gotta stop it. Unbelievable. All right, we're back. Okay, the Edmonton Oilers. I'm just gonna keep on going. I don't have time to do this over again. Uh, the Edmonton Oilers. Okay, I had them winning the President's Trophy this year. So, are they going to win the President's Trophy this year? I don't know. Why did I have them winning the President's Trophy this year? Because offense wins championships. And I think they just have too many offensive players hitting their stride this year. Uh, Connor McDavid, 25 years old, right in the heart of what is going to do. He's already got two points a game. Uh, Zach Hyman. Uh, he's 30, but he's playing on that line. He, he just keeps one of the best two-way players in the game. Leon Dreisaitl is now 27. He's not going to slow down and probably just going to keep on getting better. Um, I just thought their offense would be so overpowering that division that they would just they would rack up wins that way. Did I have concerns about their defense? Yes. Do I still have concerns about their defense? 
absolutely no doubt about it. I thought Brett Kulak would be playing better, but I wasn't sure if he could handle top four minutes. And he, he really shouldn't be. He should be down here in the five, six spot with Barry, but they have nobody to put there. And injuries could certainly cause a problem for this team on defense. And I always thought that. Um, Jack Campbell, I was concerned about that too. Just simply because historically, Jack Campbell has been fantastic or really bad. Simple as that. It's just, he always has been, so why would I think he's going to be anything other than that? The good thing is, Stuart Skinner looks like he's, well, so far, at four games, he's, a, he's beasting out. And uh, if that maintains, then they're probably okay. I think you can hear my voice and maybe not as confident as I was that they won the President's Trophy. And maybe that's the best thing. Um, it's just offensive teams like this, like Florida last year, tend to win President's Trophies. Um, so far this year, they are... Six three and zero, uh, and three and zero on the road. Three and three at home. So they they've had a, yeah, that's right. They had they've had a tough schedule. They played some tough teams at home, and you know they've been away. It's not a super tough schedule because they've been at home a lot, but it's tough in the sense their competition was pretty strong. They look pretty good, um, and I think that they will add still to this lineup on defense. And the guy I think they'll use is Kaylor Yamamoto. Kaylor Yamamoto is just not fitting anywhere. When you see a guy move from place to place and can't seem to find a place for him, and he doesn't get offense and he can only play in your top six, it gives you the impression, me the impression or me the thinking that there's some young, you know, there's some teams out there that are rebuilding that would like to give him a shot. They can add a pick to him and hopefully get something going with this defense because the defense is going to need some help. They can't do much about their goaltending. They're paying Jack Campbell a crap load of money, and I'm really concerned about that. But I'm still going to stick to my guns and say that they win the President's Trophy on the strength of just pure offensive power with Kane, Dreisaitl, Hyman, McDavid, Nugent Hopkins, uh, this line of Fogel, McLeod, and Puglia Harvey has been doing a really good shutdown role, better than they've had for a long time. So they haven't been producing offense, but at least they've been producing a strong defensive presence uh, for them, which they desperately needed. So I'm still going to go that way. Tell me what you think, guys. Yamamoto? I know everybody's going to say Jesse Puglia Harvey. We'll get an argument about that down there. His analytics are still fantastic. Um, and maybe they just got to let him go now. Maybe it's just not going to happen here. My, I believe if they do, somebody is getting a really, really good young player, though. Tell me what you think in the comment section. Subscribe to my channel. Let me know. Florida Panthers. And this was one of the most interesting teams coming in. They, I think they have like a 5-3-1 and one record right now. On the strength of a yeah five three and one record, on a really good homestand two and three they had problems on the road last year, and I think Paul Maurice is really trying to focus on this team being a better road team because he's really focusing on them playing a better road game all the time. They're cycling down low. They're playing more man on man defense like Calgary does. And this, they're also trying to gel new players in a new situation. And so far, it looks like it's working really well. Sam Reinhardt has had a little bit of difficulty there on the top line producing points, but he's looked good every time I've watched Florida. It's just the points are going for him right now. Uh, Alexander Barkoff and Verhege are doing what they normally do. Kachuk is doing taking the role of what Huberto did and playing with bit players in Sam Bennett. And it was Duclair last year, but they're trying Rudolph Balzers, who I still love that pickup. 
that Rudolph Balzer's pickup. And the line has looked pretty good. And, of course, Matthew Kachuk, like Huberto before him, is putting up a ton of offense. The difference is he's still a stud defensively. Like, I totally get why they made that trade. Matthew Kachuk is, is just a unicorn-type player. And if they can fill out the other spots that they lost, like Uyghur, um, with Uyghur, and build this defense up, this team's going to be a beast. You've got one of the best two-way centers in the league in Alexander Barkov. Sam Reinhardt is a fantastic two-way winger. Kachuk is one of the best two-way wingers in the league, one of the best leaders, and an incredible power forward that is very hard to find. Sam Bennett as well. They're building a team that is much the same as what Colorado was. And uh, I think they're going to be very successful. Uh, it's just they got to do something with the defense. And I think what's happening here when they picked up White and Lusterinen and Balsers is one of these guys or one of these forwards here are probably eventually going to be used to get a defenseman to help out. They're hoping that Matt Kirstead is able to hold on and do well. He's only getting 10 minutes a night. Um, Brandon Montour has benefited by Uyghur leaving there, and his offense has been really good. I haven't looked at his defensive analytics, but at least he's putting up a point a game and he, they, when they desperately need it because Aaron Ekblad is out. So hopefully Ekblad is back soon. They can add more to their defense. I think they will. And find out what's going to happen with their goaltending. I think Spencer Knight's going to take it over still. He, he's, he, he's only 21. He's had some couple shaky here and there. But when he settles in, you have to agree with me, Florida. Maybe you don't have to. You can tell me in the comment section if you disagree with me. When he settles in, he looks spectacular. Sergey Bobrovsky, to me, very seldom looks spectacular. All right. Tell me what you think about that, guys. Uh, Florida fans, comment. Subscribe to my channel, comment in the comment section, and let me know. All right, Los Angeles Kings. Uh, I'm going to keep on going here. I'm having s s problems, but I'm going to keep on going. Velarde, Kopitar, and Kempe has been, have been absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I think the whole lineup, I'm going to keep this short and sweet, really, with LA. I think the lineup is fine. They could use some size on defense. We've known that for a while, but they have lots of pieces on defense, especially on the right side. You got Sean Dersey playing the left side well, by the way, um, because they have so much wealth of talent on the right side. And more coming up. Helge Grimes, Jordan Spence playing down there. They would, uh, they would probably be playing in most lineups right now. And, of course, Brant Clark. So... LA's got all the weapons in the world to add to their defense or their biggest problem, the goaltending. Quick has not looked good to start. Peterson still doesn't look good. I've mentioned this several times already on the uh, on these uh, did trade proposals videos on LA getting goaltending, and now I I just honestly think it's come to the point where they got to use these assets to get a goaltender out there. Who they're going to get, a, I don't know. It's it's a very difficult position to fill during the season. But something, I believe something has to be done. Maybe Quick will turn it around. He had a good year last year, but he's 36 years old now. And Peterson, it just keeps, it has to happen. He does have a 3-1 and one winning record, but that's mostly because L.A. has bailed him out with their offense. They haven't looked good. And I think the defenses look fine. I seriously think. Goaltending was the problem, right, is the problem. And I thought goaltending may be a problem before the season starts, and I can't change my mind. Tell me what you think about that, L.A. fans. Do you think that L.A. has a goaltending problem and they should go get more goaltending? Minnesota Wild. 
For Minnesota, I had them possibly winning the Central in the beginning of the season. Uh, it's been a little bit of a rough go for them. They got, because uh, Fleury started off rough. And he does that. It always takes time for Flurry to get going, pretty much all the time. I don't know why. I don't know why he hasn't been able to rectify it. But Minnesota played some pretty good games where he really was the reason why they lost it. I mean, simple as that. Lately, though, it looks like he's back on track again. And I think Minnesota will be fine. Four and four. They kept it going. They got their wins, especially on the road here. They found ways to win against Chicago. Uh, you know, they're, they're winning the games that they really need to win, especially against weaker competition. There was also going to be a little bit of an issue with working in some guys in the lineup after uh, trading Fiala. Uh, Ryan Hartman, I, I don't know. He hasn't looked good. And, and look, he's injured here. They don't know when. Maybe that's why. So, are they going to win the Central now? Do I, am I as confident as I was? I think Fleury's in. I, I always will believe in Mark andre Fleury. I think he's going to turn it around, and this team will be very well. Maybe not win the Central, but I think they're going to be fine. Are they going to add in the future? If they're close, you can be assured that they're going to try to find a way to add in the future. Where? You know, maybe some... You know, depth defensemen, uh, or maybe they'll solve that center spot issue that they have. Goudreau is good, but is he a number one center? They're waiting on Rossi. It's really going to come down to when they think Rossi will be ready. He's 21 years old. He hasn't got a point yet. He's looked pretty good, but he hasn't looked great. He looks like he's at least a year away. So I think it's possible they go out and get a center for this year and next year or something like that and let Rossi work his way up in the lineup. Tell me what you think, Minnesota fans, especially with Felino and Greenway being gone. Man, that's going to be tough. But one man up. I, I don't think we've seen the best of Minnesota. Minnesota Wild fans, tell me what you think about that. Montreal, quite simply, playing with so much heart. It's... Uh, they're playing with a lot of heart, not giving up on anything. They just came back heavy on St. Louis, shot the lights out on them. It, it's quite simply for Montreal, if you go in there without a workman, without your work hat on, you're probably going to get beat. And that's Marty St. Louis. He has done an amazing job with these guys playing with pride and Nick Suzuki. I know, uh, who was it? Was it Marshawn that came out and said that he thought it was too much to give to young players a captaincy like that. I don't know. It looks like a captain to me out there on the ice. Like, I realize that that's the case sometimes. That, you know, like Taylor Hall, for instance, in Edmonton, it didn't seem to work out well. And there's been many other instances of it. But I think Nick, I don't think that's the case with Nick Suzuki. I think he's going to be fine. Overall, I love their work ethic. I think they'll wear down over the season. They're just too young. Building their bodies up for an 82-game schedule yet. I, I, over the course of an 82-game schedule, guys like Caden Goulet, Jordan Harris, uh, Kovacevic, Chekai. Is that how you say it? Please. I think that's how you say it. These guys are going to wear down, almost for sure. Jake Allen, he always starts out well. But if you overwork him, it tends to fall off. And Samuel Maltenbull is a guy that, I don't know, he's interesting. He's a big guy. He's got reflexes. He could hit his stride this year, but I haven't seen it. And like we haven't seen it yet. I'm going to assume it's not going to happen. And eventually Montreal will go down. But if you're going to go into Montreal's barn and not work hard or take him for granted, they're going to beat you. They're going to beat you. What do I think they do in the future? I think they move guys like Mike Hoffman. Um, I don't know, Sean Monaghan, if he wants to stick around. He's made a case for himself to maybe get traded to a contender as well. Christian Dvorak, you know, they. I think they'll end up trading a few players for some picks and keep on rolling here. Maybe even Jake Allen, especially if Samuel Maltenbow looks like he, he can step up and take the role for a while. Uh, 
sad to see guys like Jonathan Drouin, man. I don't know what happened with this guy. Commitment or whatever. He's had mental health. If it's, you know, all those things, man, I hope you overcome it, dude. I hope you, I, I'm not even hope. It's just, you'll overcome it. He'll overcome it, but it just hasn't happened yet. And to don't off, doesn't surprise me he's not playing. He just has slipped and slipped and slipped. And when I saw him in Vegas, he looked, the only time he looked engaged was after they almost traded him and he woke up and started playing a little bit. He, ever since he left Florida, the guy just looks like he's mailed it in and took the paycheck. So, all right. Tell me what you think about that Montreal Canadiens fans. And that is my whole 42. That's all I got for you today. Uh, sub up to my channel. Let me know about what you thought about all that. Things went a little long. Have a great day, everybody. Okay.